It's Tuesday, October 18th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, could vampires exist, mathematically speaking? Plus, an update on COVID variants of concern as we head into winter. And the United Kingdom has ruled that GIFs are still relevant and Meta can't hog them all. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. Around Halloween, even academics like to get into the holiday spirit. Archaeologists might share medieval recipes or supposedly cursed artifacts. Historians might explain how various creature myths came to be. And mathematicians? Well, they'll explain exactly how long the human species would survive if vampires were real. Or at least some mathematicians. And more than you would think— Ella Morton over at Atlas Obscura published a roundup of several actually published in legitimate journal studies using mathematical modeling to show humans' prospects in a world also inhabited by vampires. So, as Morton explains, each of these studies used specific examples from literary or film sources to determine their constraints on vampire behavior. And the earliest study Morton found comes from 1982, and Austrian mathematicians Richard Hartle and Alexander Melman. Their first paper on the subject, yes, they published more than one, titled The Transylvanian Problem of Renewable Resources in the operations research journal RARO, divides vampires into three categories based basically on level of hunger or satiability. However, they found that no matter what type of vampires largely inhabited this alternate reality Earth, they would quickly face a problem of diminishing returns. Morton quoted their paper, We're facing a typical consumption resource trade-off. The vampire society derives utility from consumption of blood, but in sucking the blood of a human being and in turning him into a vampire, the resource of human beings is reduced, whereas the number of vampires is increased. Both of these effects diminish the resource of humans per vampire, curtailing future possibilities of consumption." End quote. So in this paper, Hartle and Melman are working with the premise that a human being is always turned into a vampire when their blood is sucked, as opposed to simply being left for dead. And I feel like most vampire tales leave humans for dead and only rarely turn them into vampires. But hey, we're going to work within the bounds of each interpretation for these models. And dang did Hartle and Melman bring the modeling. It's pretty cool scrolling through their paper and seeing the sheer number of equations in there while keeping in mind the topic at hand. Like, here's one excerpt from the paper, quote, The expected resource of human beings at time t will be denoted by h parentheses t. Every person who, when alive, has had his blood sucked by a vampire will, after his immediate death, deal with other persons in like manner. Without loss of generality, the following dynamic systems equation may be derived. V equals negative AV plus CV. H equals NH minus CV, where N denotes the growth rate of the human population, A denotes the failure rate of vampires due to contact with sunlight, crucifixes, garlic, and vampire hunters, the blood-sucking rate per vampire at time T is given by C parentheses T, blood is measured in units defined by the average capacity of the human body. End quote. I love it. Hartleman and Melman got even nerdier a year later in the journal Applied Mathematical Modeling, using a model based on the Lotka-Volterra prey-predator system. But I want to go ahead and just jump ahead to some more recent papers that Morton also shared in Atlas Obscura. So published in 2007 in the journal Skeptical Inquirer, Costa Eftimio and Sohong Gandhi tackled ghosts, zombies, and vampires through a physics lens with the aim of, quote, illuminating inconsistencies associated with these myths and giving practical explanation to certain aspects, end quote. Now, on ghosts, they tackled the idea of materiallessness, as well as the common trope of the temperature around a ghost being much colder than the ambient temperature. 
For zombies, I was pleased to see that they focused on cultural faiths from places like Haiti, from which many pop culture depictions of zombies are appropriated. And from there, they interrogated cases of disease, which make a person appear to be dead when they really aren't quite yet. And this paper in particular is really fascinating, so if you want to read the whole thing, check out the link in the show notes. But let's stick to the author's points on vampires for now. So they used the same conceit of Hartle and Melman that a human whose blood is sucked will always turn into a vampire, thereby every feeding decreases the human population and increases the vampire one. So even assuming that vampires abstain to just one feeding a month, the authors, using population data, say vampires would wipe out humans within three years. And if human death rates from other causes, as well as vampiric and human birth rates, are taken into account, the situation is actually even more bleak for humans. Quoting Ephthemu and Gandhi, We conclude that vampires cannot exist, since their existence contradicts the existence of human beings. Incidentally, the logical proof that we just presented is of a type known as reductio ad absurdum, that is, reduction to the absurd. Another philosophical principle related to our argument is the truism given the elaborate title, the anthropic principle. This states that if something is necessary for human existence, then it must be true since we do exist. In the present case, the non-existence of vampires is necessary for human existence. Apparently, whomever devised the vampire legend had failed his college algebra and philosophy courses. End quote. Now, Morton found a rebuttal from Oxford statistics professor Dino Sajinovic, who published a paper pointing out some of the holes in Ephthemu and Gandhi's analysis, namely understanding the sophisticated relationship between vampires and non-vampires, which I appreciated being brought into the mix. You know, math is super helpful, but humans, and I would assume vampires, especially if we go by the the what-we-do-in-the-shadows model, are not entirely rational, predictable beings. So I do think that some margin of error to account for chaos and relational strategies is warranted. Now that said, the numbers from most of these papers are so stark in favor of vampires that the margin of error barely seems relevant. Now, Morton shared one last paper from Wadham Strzelkowski, Evgeny Lisson, and Emily Wilkins, published in Applied Mathematical Sciences in 2013, and this one analyzes three different models of vampirism based on popular depictions. First, in the Stoker-King model, based on Bram Stoker's Dracula and Stephen King's Salem's Lot, it would take just 165 days for 80% of the human population to be wiped out. It would further take just two months for the vampire population to jump from 1 to 4,000. The authors compare it to the outbreak of a deadly virus. Jeez. Next, they ran an analysis using Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles, in which humans can actually continue living as humans after being fed on by a vampire. But even with that caveat, humans would still go extinct within 50 years of the first vampire attack. Now, finally, the authors turn to the harris meyer kostova model. This was based on the Charlene Harris book series that inspired True Blood, the Twilight Saga by Stephanie Meyer, and Elizabeth Kostova's The Bloodsucker. Morton notes that humans live peacefully alongside vampires in each of these. Now, I'm only familiar with Twilight, but I know that in that world, vampires can also exist on the blood of non-human animals, even though most choose not to, so that might help humans' prospects overall here. Quoting Morton, The initial conditions of the harris meyer kostova model involve 5 million vampires, 6.16 billion people, and organized groups of drainers, humans who attack vampires to drain their blood and leave them for dead. Within this setup, there are system parameters that would stabilize the populations of humans and vampires in time, meaning that humans could stand a chance, end quote. But, the authors note, quote, "...the symbiosis is very fragile, and whenever the growth rate of the human population slows down, the bloodthirst of vampires accelerates, or vampire drainers become too greedy, the whole system lies in ruins, with just one population remaining." End quote. So, no model by any of these scientists or mathematicians looks really good for us humans. Which, I think, means Ethemu and Gandhi had it right. Vampires don't exist, because if they did, mathematically, 
us humans certainly would not. But it's still all kind of fun to think about. And if you want more of scientists discussing Halloween-adjacent topics, you should check out the podcast SciShow Tangents and their current trick-or-treat-themed month. Full disclosure, I was a guest on the most recent episode about gourds, so this is partially a shameless self-promotion. However, other spooky episodes this month include creepy crawly critters and preserved foods. It makes sense if you listen. And there is a four seasons worth of backlog of other fascinating topics to learn about in SciShow Tangent's game show format. So link to listen to that is in the show notes. We have long known that a COVID surge would come this fall and winter, just like the cold, flu, and other respiratory illnesses surge this time of year, but now we know what flavor it will be. BA5 is out, and BQ1 is in, or it's probably about to be. BQ1 and its sublineage BQ1.1 currently make up an estimated 11.4% of infections across the United States, according to the CDC's COVID data tracker. BA5, in the U.S. at least, is still the dominant variant. And like usual, the new variants are spreading most heavily in New York and New Jersey to begin with. They have also been spreading throughout Europe, typically a sign like clockwork that cases will rise in the U.S. soon. There has also been concern about another lineage called XBB. Quoting the Washington Post, XBB appears to be the best at evading immunity. Researchers in China have found that XBB can elude the protective antibodies generated by a breakthrough BA5 infection, raising concern that fall boosters engineered to target the BA4 and BA5 versions of Omicron may be quickly outpaced. Still, those booster shots remain the best tool on the shelf. End quote. Dr. Anthony Fauci additionally echoed concerns from other experts that any of the variants could evade antibody medications, saying, quote, That's the reason why people are concerned about BQ1.1, for the double reason of its doubling time and the fact that it seems to elude important monoclonal antibodies, end quote. And to that point, quoting from Time, More research is needed about BQ1 and BQ1.1, but a study posted online in October, which has not yet been peer-reviewed, warned that current herd immunity and BA5 vaccine boosters may not provide sufficiently broad protection against infection as the virus continues to evolve. The researchers found that BQ1.1 is able to evade antibodies from past BA5 infections, which suggests it may also be able to dodge protection from vaccines. The study also found that monoclonal antibody drugs, including Evusheld, which is used to protect people who are immunocompromised and do not respond well to COVID-19 vaccines, are less effective against BQ1.1 compared to earlier strains of the virus, end quote. As indicated above, though, there is still a lot we don't know yet about all of these variants, how much more severe they might be, what kind of impact they might have, etc. And meanwhile, hospitalizations and case numbers remain low. CBS News says only 1% of Americans live in counties that currently have high COVID-19 community levels, the point at which the CDC recommends indoor masking and other preventative measures. So that is reassuring for now. And even with the expected surge, which is based on indoor activities ticking up, travel around holidays, and the unfortunately slow uptick in vaccinations, there is still good news for BQ1 and 1.1. They are descended from BA5, and since the latest Omicron boosters were designed to protect against BA4 and BA5, they should provide some protection against these new descendants of BA5. Or at least this latest booster will help you out a lot more than the original vaccines, which were designed around the alpha and beta versions of COVID, not the Omicron ones. We always knew that BA5 would not reign forever. Experts assumed there would be a new subvariant when we hit the winter surge. It was just a matter of having vaccines closer in evolution, not matching exactly. Vaccines help mitigate symptoms and spread. They don't prevent or solve everything but they do help. So if you can, go get that Omicron booster. So remember a few weeks ago when I talked about the rise and fall of the GIF or GIF? 
and specifically how GIF search engine Giphy was under fire with the United Kingdom's Competition and Markets Authority because Meta had bought them and the UK authority said that that sale was far too anti-competitive. And then Giphy's entire case was centered around how it's not anti-competitive because GIFs are a dying medium that aren't cool anymore. It was a pretty wild argument and gave me a good excuse to dive into the nuances of GIF usage as well as annoy all of you with my pronunciation of GIF. Well, the UK's CMA has just officially upheld their original position. Meta buying Giphy was anti-competitive, and they will now have to sell the GIF search engine. Quoting Gizmodo, The British regulator determined that the acquisition could allow Meta to limit other social media platforms' access to GIFs, making those sites less attractive to users and less competitive, wrote the CMA in a press statement announcing the order. The agency also found the deal has removed Giphy as a potential challenger in the UK display advertising market, preventing UK businesses from benefiting from innovation in this market. When Meta bought Giphy in May 2020, the company was already facing regulatory probes in Washington, D.C. for alleged anti-competitive behavior. At the time, multiple Meta platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp, all integrated Giphy's API. And lots of other social media sites did too, from Twitter to Signal and Slack. By snapping up Giphy, Meta not only absorbed the largest GIF company out there, but also bought itself a portal into these other competing social media giants." End quote. So when you put it that way, I mean, listen, GIFs may be dying out, but it's going to be a very long, slow death. They're still used a ton everywhere, on every platform, and I gotta say, I'm kinda glad Meta won't have their hands on almost all of them. But that is it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.